Hi, Medical Wildcats. I'm Joseph Guggenheim. I'm a 1972 alum of the medical school. And today's presentation is on how a new medical school in Chicago began. It all began with a meeting on the bridge that uh, went over uh, the Chicago River at Rush Street. Chicago in 1835 looked quite different from the way it does today. Uh, you can see in this map, uh, dated 1835, uh, that uh, uh, the, the northernmost street on the map is superior and the uh, uh, next to the lowest street on the map, which would be the farthest east, is Pine. Pine became Michigan Avenue. So you can see that where Pine and uh, Superior intersected was right at the lakeshore. So the area that is now the uh, medical school campus was actually underwater uh, in 1835. The population in 1835 was 3,265. There were uh, 25 physicians, but uh, most of them were there to improve their personal fortune through either agriculture or real estate speculation. During the colonial period and the early 19th century, most uh, practicing physicians trained by becoming the apprentice of another physician. By 1840, 43 medical colleges had been organized uh, but 36 were still in operation. The standards were very lax. Attendance was not required. Only 25 required any kind of anatomic dissection, and that was the only lab work. Only nine required hospital attendance. The second course was simply a repetition of the first. Terms ranged from less than 16 weeks to six months, and the standards had to be lowered in order to attract students. By the beginning of the Civil War, only half of the practitioners in the United States had ever attended a medical college. When the physicians, instead of universities, came into control of the medical schools, they eliminated three of the features, uh, including a prolonged free medical education, a long term of lectures, the terms were shortened uh, from four to three months, and the time was required, was a uh, requirement was shortened to only two terms if a preliminary year had been spent with a physician preceptor. In 1847, the American Medical Association recommended reforms, but each school waited for the others to move first for fear of losing students. By the end of the 19th century, more than 400 medical colleges had opened in the United States. Most of them had closed. There had been 39 in Illinois. Most of these colleges were attempts by small groups of physicians to gain prestige, money, or both. In Illinois, uh, there was a medical college in St. Charles in Jacksonville, and then a new college opened in 1837 in Chicago. Uh, the students uh, 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 were very uh, inferior uh, compared to today's standards. Uh, Dr. Nathan Davis said that in the almost universal neglect of a proper preliminary education, we find hundreds who, while they carry a Latin diploma in their pocket, cannot write six lines in accordance with the rules of English, the English grammar. Now he said this in the uh, mid 19th century, but he was preceded by Daniel Drake, uh, who uh, uh, is uh, pretty much forgotten because he had a, a smaller audience uh, uh, speaking in 1820 uh, in uh, Ohio. He said medical students were being recruited from those who were too weak to labor on a farm or in a workshop, or addicted to study, but too stupid for the bar, or too immoral for the pulpit. The faculties of these schools uh, uh, were also inferior. Uh, it was thought that uh, there were only seven parts of, uh, of medicine, so that seven professors made a complete faculty. Some of the schools tried to get by with fewer than seven professors, by combining several disciplines into one professorship. Some student migration occurred, that is, students went from school to school to listen to lectures. And some of the professors actually used their lecture notes from their own student days to give lectures. Dr. Daniel Brainard came to Chicago in 1836 at age 24. At that time, he applied for a charter for a medical college. The charter was granted in 1837 two days before the charter for the city of Chicago. So uh, this was the first educational institution receiving a charter in Illinois before there was even a chartered high school or university. In 1858, Brainerd ran for mayor of Chicago, but lost. 
He named his school Rush Medical College, named after Dr. Benjamin Rush, a physician who signed the Declaration of Independence. Brainard, however, was not very enthusiastic about the name. When giving lectures, uh, he sometimes referred to his home school as Medical School of Chicago. The, student, the, the uh, school did not accept students for seven years. When they opened, there was no stipulation about previous formal schooling. The annual term was 16 weeks. There were only four to seven professors on the, on the faculty. And all courses were taught simultaneously, meaning that uh, what the students heard the second year was just a repeat of what they heard the first. The requirements for an MD degree from Rush remained unchanged for decades. The announcements for the college said that three years of study with a respectable physician, uh, two identical courses of lectures, the last being in this school, uh, two years of practice to be accepted in lieu of one course. The candidate must be 21 years of age, good moral character, present a thesis on some medical subject of his own composition and in his own handwriting, and pass an exam on all branches of medicine. There was a $5 dissecting fee listed, but this was optional to take or decline. Uh, so these standards were uh, quite inferior to even the earliest medical schools in the colonies. There was sharp competition among medical schools to relax the standards uh, because this was a necessity to keep students. In 1857, a plan for a new curriculum was proposed uh, chiefly by uh, uh, two Rush professors, Dr. Davis and Dr. Byford. They proposed an extension of the annual term and dividing the students into junior and senior classes and having graded lectures for each class. This was presented to the Rush faculty and it was accepted unanimously. But when presented to Brainard and the trustees, they rejected the changes, fearing loss of patronage from the adoption of higher standards. So let's meet these two men. Davis joined the Rush faculty in 1851, uh, coming from uh, New York, where he had also campaigned for uh, 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 changes in medical education. He advocated an adequate preliminary education, longer annual courses of instruction, enlarging the faculty, grading the students into three annual courses of instruction, and making dissection and hospital clinical instruction a requirement. Uh, he was unhappy increasingly unhappy over the failure uh, to convert Brainard or the trustees to his uh, way of thinking. His colleagues described him as untiring, irrepressible, uncompromising, and incorruptible. His colleague, William Byford, was almost wholly self-educated. Byford uh, applied for an apprenticeship as a blacksmith, uh, but he was rejected. So then he became a tailor's apprentice. Uh, he then uh, apprenticed under a local physician in Indiana and read medical books on his own. He entered uh, Ohio Medical College where he was granted a degree in 1845. He then went to Rush and became chair of obstetrics and diseases of women and children in 1857, but resigned two years later to help organize a new medical department. He was a pioneer in the medical education of women and was one of the co-founders of the Northwestern University Women's College of Medicine. A revolution in medical education in the United States occurred when three men met on the Rush Street Bridge. Dr. Dudley, a uh, former president emeritus of Northwestern, uh, wrote how he had heard uh, Davis, Andrews, and Johnson tell of a casual meeting on the Rush Street Bridge when they initiated the idea of a radical departure in American medical education. We don't have any, meet, any minutes of this meeting. We don't even know the date of it, but uh, uh, Dr. Dudley uh, uh, said he had heard that these three men talk of uh, changing medical education. And these three men were Nathan Smith Davis, Edmund Andrews, and Hosmer Johnson. We've already met Davis. Let's look at uh, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Andrews. Dr. Andrews uh, had also favored medical changes in medical education even before he came to Chicago. While he was on the faculty at the University of Michigan, he wrote essays on a greater system of teaching and requiring a, a reasonable preliminary education to be admitted to medical schools. He joined the Rush faculty in 1855 in the anatomy department, but he quickly fell out of favor with Brainard. He was a surgery professor 
in the new school that was organized for 46 years. He was one of the first to adopt Lister's antiseptic techniques in surgery. He was interested in, um, in military medicine and was known to fire a musket uh, into a cadaver in order to demonstrate to students uh, what damage could be done by a uh, gunshot. Hosmer Johnson uh, moved to Chicago in 1849 and then enrolled as a student in Rush. He joined the faculty the year after graduation, but he resigned in 1859 over a disagreement with Brainard. He negotiated with the trustees of a new university, which was being formed called Lent University. He was a surgeon who limited his practice to surgery of the nose and throat. After the Chicago fire of 1871, he worked as a supervisor for the uh, distribution of aid. One of his sons became Dean at Northwestern. We do have a record of the meeting which occurred on March 12th, 1859. This was attended by these four doctors. It was held in the office of Drs. Rudder and Isham. The object was to organize a medical department for this new university, Lent University. Dr. Johnson was elected chairman and Dr. Isham was elected secretary. So let's meet these men. Dr. Isham graduated from Bellevue Hospital Medical College in New York City, uh, but then while an intern there, he developed tuberculosis. The cure at that time was clean air. So he became a ship surgeon for a while and then moved to Chicago in 1855 for the clean air there. He shared an office with Dr. Rudder, who was 31 years his senior. He also learned antiseptic technique while visiting uh, London and uh, meeting Dr. Lister and brought this technique to Chicago. The Ishams were pillars of uh, Chicago society. Several generations served on the boards of Passivant Hospital. Uh, one of the uh, Ishams uh, uh, was lost in the Titanic disaster. Dr. Isham's son, uh, George Isham, was also a surgeon at uh, uh, the new medical school. Uh, he built a, a home at uh, 1340 North State Parkway, which is still in existence. The architect for this home was a, a young architect from New York City uh, who was building his first home in the Chicago area named James Gamble Rogers. Two decades later, Rogers was the architect for uh, the medical school building, a medical school campus uh, uh, designing the uh, Ward building, Thorn building, uh, Weibo building, and uh, later Abbott Hall. He also designed uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, collegiate Gothic buildings on the Evanston campus, including the iconic Deering Library uh, and uh, Dyke Stadium. Dr. Rudder, his senior partner, uh, uh, obtained his MD from Pennsylvania uh, in 1823 and then moved to Chicago in 1849. At the new school, he was an honorary emeritus professor of OB and diseases of women because uh, it was thought that at age 58, he was an old man. He was considered the patriarch of the group. He was one of the four signers of the original agreement with Lent University. He died in age, uh, 60, at age 65 after Lincoln's assassination, uh, he was uh, uh, admired Lincoln greatly and it was thought that this brought on his demise. Uh, Dr. Brainard uh, never forgave the uh, uh, doctors who left his faculty and uh, in the Chicago Medical Journal, which he edited, uh, his, Dr. Uh, Rudder's uh, death notice was only two lines. At the March 12th meeting, uh, they elected uh, Dr. Johnson as the chairman and uh, decided that Lent University would provide rent-free facilities for three years. For three years, the faculty would not accept any pay and degrees would be conferred by the university upon recommendation of the faculty. The faculty uh, was to consist of 11 professorships instead of the customary six or seven. And these four doctors uh, uh, were appointed uh, to these positions. Uh, there were seven others that were going to be appointed later in uh, the uh, uh, listed uh, uh, specialties. Professorships were all also offered to uh, three doctors who did not attend the meeting, Dr. Davis and Dr. Byford, as well as John Hollister in Materia Medica, which is what, uh, which would be pharmacology nowadays. Uh, the courses would be given at two different levels, junior and senior levels, instead of simply repeating the junior year. 
The third year would be clinical instructions in hospitals. The group met three days later on March 15th, and the final faculty was uh, finalized, uh, including these, uh, these men. On March 24th, uh, they had another meeting and elected these as the faculty uh, with Dr. Johnson as the president uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Isham as recording secretary, Byford as secre corresponding secretary, and Andrews as treasurer. So these were the four men who were negotiating with Lent University. Lent University was a new school. It uh, was located in Lake Forest, about 40 miles north of the loop on Chicago's North Shore. It was named for the Chicagoan Sylvester Lent, who was a successful uh, businessman in the lumber business, banking, and real estate. Uh, Mr. Lent uh, uh, made and lost several fortunes during his lifetime. Uh, before the Civil War, he was a uh, part of the Underground Railroad to help slaves, estate, uh, help slaves escape uh, uh, from the South. And after the Civil War, he helped uh, the freed slaves uh, get employment. In 1859, Lent University was, had only established a preparatory school, but the university wanted to also establish liberal arts and professional schools. The school had a setback uh, during the Civil War, a financial setback, uh, and had to reorganize uh, after the war as Lake Forest University. Uh, Mr. Lent uh, could not fulfill his uh, financial promises to the university. The medical department of the university was uh, housed in what was called the Lent Block at the northwest corner of West Randolph and Market Street. Market is now North Wacker. Uh, you can see in the picture of this building uh, that uh, it says it was at the northeast corner, but most sources say northwest. This was the site for the school's clinics, labs, the library, lecture halls, museum faculty rooms, and anatomy rooms. The students received daily uh, bedside lectures at nearby Mercy Hospital. The opening session uh, uh, began in October 1859. Uh, Dr. Davis made the opening remarks. Uh, and it's quite remarkable that the school got organized in less than seven months. Remember those initial meetings were in March, 1859. And uh, Davis said that the school would be uh, different from the uh, previous schools. Uh, they would, the school would promote the educational interests of the profession without reference to established customs and usage and the medical education would be given in accordance with sound educational principles uh, and better adapted to the present state of science and art and medicine than that which has so long been adhered to by the medical schools of the country. So this school was ready to break with tradition. The term began the next day, October 10th, 1859 and ended on March 5th, 1860. The first session had 33 students. There were 19 juniors and 14 seniors. The enrollment increased to 79 by the fourth year. The clinical instruction was given at, Mer at Mercy Hospital, also at an orphan asylum uh, near the hospital, and a free dispensary at the medical school on the Lent block. The inducement for the students would be better education, thorough preparation to practice medicine, and smaller classes not what had been used before to induce students, uh, which was short sessions, low fees, and uh, lax standards. Uh, longer terms, higher tuitions, and selective admission standards uh, were thought to be deterrents to uh, mass, uh, mass attendance. The announcement said that good room and board could be obtained uh, in the city for 250 to 350 per week, far cry from what it is now. By 1868, uh, Following the Civil War, inflation had caused these amounts to go up to five to six fifty per week. But by about 1870, they had uh, fell down to about four dollars per week. The tuition for the medical school, far cry from what it is now, was uh, sixty dollars plus some fees. Uh, Thirty-five dollars was the uh, tuition at Rush. The original faculty con uh, consisted of these twelve men. You can see that uh, five of them. Uh, uh, were from the previous Rush faculty uh, and the others were not. In this picture, uh, these men, except for Dr. Rudder in the lower right, all look much younger than the pictures I showed. And that's because they were quite young when the school was formed. Dr. Rudder, as I said, was considered the patriarch uh, at age 58 when the school organized. 
Meanwhile, what was happening across town at Rush? The enrollment was 374 by 1866. And Dr. Brainard uh, uh, never forgave the doctors who left and formed a new school. Uh, he said that uh, the new school, the plan proposed, had nothing to whatever to the education of the student, the requirements for graduation, or the means of acquiring knowledge, and called the new school a model great reform school, and it was housed in a cock loft of a warehouse. He called Davis the apostle of a false doctrine whose role was that of a Jeremiah lamenting the alleged evils of medical education. And he called the faculty pseudo reformers, apostles of reform and phantoms in black because they dressed in black coats. So I'll continue this on uh, further episodes uh, talking about the uh, history of this uh, new school and changes in medical education that occurred. In the meantime, what happened to Lent University? Well, it became Lake Forest University in Lake Forest in 1865. And then in the 20th century, it became Lake Forest College. And whatever happened to that Rush Street Bridge? On November 3rd, 1863, a herd of cattle was being driven across the bridge. A boat on the Chicago River blew its whistle. The cattle stampeded and destroyed the bridge. The bridge was rebuilt uh, but it was destroyed by the Great Fire of 1871. Currently, there is no bridge that crosses at Rush Street. And what happened to that new medical school? It became one of the best in the United States. But let's get together virtually again next month. In the meantime, uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and stay connected. And I look forward to getting together next month.